So, hello everybody. Welcome to the third day of our Granada seminar. It's a pleasure to be here with you, here, there, everywhere, delocalized de on the cloud. And um, <clears throat> today we have a very uh, interesting program. We will start with uh, Julia Jomans, and afterwards we will have uh, Danielle Fisher. So it's a very uh, exciting and stimulating program that, that we have today. Uh, I just realized right now that uh, we have Julia and Danielle talking and, and I have two kids, Julia and Danielle. So if that's a coincidence, I wanted to share it with you. Anyway, so let me introduce very briefly, um, even if she doesn't need this, but uh, I will. So Julia is a, is a British theoretical physicist. She graduated and got the PhD in Oxford in the direction of Robin Stinchcomb. And uh, she was working for, for the doctoral research on critical phenomena spin, spin models. Actually, she's uh, best known to many of us for her book on the statistical mechanics on phase transitions that many of us, including myself, has used as a primary in, in, our, in our courses at the university for undergraduates or graduates. And uh, she has de developed most of her career in Oxford. And uh, she's uh, very well known and recognized for her development of novel numeric numerical and analytical modeling tools to investigate a wide range, wide range of complex fluids. And for example, she created uh, new techniques covering wide range of uh, length and time scales from microscopic to collective hydrodynamics. For example, she helped developing the lattice Boltzmann simulations for liquid gas and binary fluids. She has very highly cited publications on these issues. Julia's research combines her expertise in statistical physics with the power of modern computers in multifaceted uh, covering self-assembly at molecular and macroscopic levels, drops moving in micro, micro channels or in um, surfaces, the rheology of highly non-Newtonian fluids, such as liquid crystal, and most recently, interactions between bacterial swimmers. Actually, she will be talking today about uh, this last uh, issue. The title, I guess, it's uh, self-propelled topological defects. So please, uh, Julia, we are all, okay. all good with you. Great. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. And greetings to everybody from, from Oxford, where it's actually sunny for once, so it does look pretty much like this picture. I'm going to talk about active matter today. Oh. oh my goodness. I'm going to talk about active matter. So first of all, I talk about active pneumatics. And I want this this first part's really an introduction to give you some an overview of the field. So I'm going to introduce active turbulence and then talk about self-propelled topological defects. And then the second part of the talk is really quite new work, which has either just been published or is not published yet, when we're trying to think how some of these ideas from active matter can be used in biological systems. And then maybe I'll have time to talk about confined defects, but, but maybe not. So it's very much a jump between the first part is sort of very much background and the second part is, is really new and we really don't understand an awful lot yet. So active matter, this is material which takes energy from its surroundings and it takes it on the individual particle level and it uses it to do work. So that tends to be um, a, a description of biological systems. Biological systems are always taking energy from their surroundings and using it to move around, using it to be alive. Um, and so active matter is maybe just physicists trying to mus muscle in and do biology. And particularly for this conference, it's, it's relevant because active systems, biological systems are meant to be out of thermodynamic equilibrium. They're meant to exist and they're meant to operate out of equilibrium. So I'm going to concentrate on dense active matter. So let's look at uh, a suspension of bacteria and see what happens when you have lots of bacteria swimming together. So this is a layer, a two-dimensional layer of swimming microswimmers. This is actually E. coli bacteria. And you can see that you get a state which looks turbulent. It looks very chaotic. And at first sight, that's rather surprising 
because these things are tiny and turbulence is meant to happen at large length scales. And so we're getting another sort of turbulent like state, which has been called active turbulence or mesoscale turbulence. Now if that just happened in swimmers, maybe it wouldn't be so exciting, but if you start looking at these, these different systems, you can find it all over the place. Um, for example, these are uh, epithelial cells. So they're the cells that coat um, many of the cavities of the body. So you get them on the inside of your stomach or your lungs. And if you take them out of there, or possibly out of an animal and put them on a, on a, on a Petri dish, they don't just sit there, they move around like this. And again, you get this turbulent like behavior. They're transducing energy from their surroundings. And so they have to find something to do with it. That's one of the ways cells move pretty much randomly, uh, but also cells can move like this. They can uh, not move randomly at all. They can move in a flocking like motion um, when they all somehow collectively move in the same direction. And there are lots of questions still about why. What is going on in the biology to tell you the difference between the active turbulence and the flocking like motion of these cells. Now I'm going to talk about one more example. And this is an example which is a, again an active system, but a fabricated one, which was first produced in the Dogic group. And this is um, a system where one has lots of microtubules, these very long polymers. And the microtubules have molecular motors between them. And the molecular motors have a certain directionality on the polymers. And so if they're moving in the right direction, so these heads are moving this way, they'll push the microtubule that way. And if these heads are moving that way, they'll push the microtubule down here. So what happens is that these things organize themselves into bundles moving in different directions. And let's see how these bundles uh, move. And again, you see this turbulent like state, but there is some sort of structure in there. And we'll come back to, to look and think a little bit more about that structure. What these yellow sort of, sorry, the, the white stringy things are doing here is, is that these are, the, these are these bundles of microtubules being driven around by the molecular motors. So this active turbulence, how do I write down the theory for this active turbulence? How are we going to describe it? Well, it turns out that the place to start is with liquid crystals. So let me just remind you about liquid crystals and about the idea of a pneumatic phase. The pneumatic phase is made up of long molecules. So they have a preferred direction, but the top and the bottom are the same as each other. And those are described by a director field N, which is a headless vector. And in the pneumatic phase, the molecules or the colloids tend to line up so they're pointing in the same direction. So there's orientational order, but no long range positional order. And we're going to need an order parameter to describe that state. And the order parameter we'll use is the Q tensor. And you don't need to worry too much about the Q tensor except to know that it's an order parameter. Its largest eigenvector gives the direction of the order and its largest eigenvalue gives the magnitude of the order. Now, sometimes this pneumatic ordering goes wrong and it can go wrong in a big way at topological defects. Topological defects are mistakes in the ordering and they're called topological because things are going wrong all the way out to infinity. You can't unknot this defect if you like, you can't get the ordering right without changing the director configuration all the way out to infinity. So on its own, a defect like this would have an infinite energy. So what happens is that they tend to, uh, in real systems, they always have to turn up in pairs. And uh, in particular, in two dimensions, and we'll be sitting in two dimensions to start with. In two dimensions, the most, the most common defects are this one, which is a plus a half defect. So if you remember the shape, it's the one that's like a comet. And then you also get the minus a half defects, which have this threefold symmetry. And in an ordinary 
passive liquid crystal, what happens is that slowly these defects will move towards each other and they will annihilate in pairs until hopefully you end up with a perfect pneumatic ordering and your computer screen works very well. So we want to understand about the dynamics of this system. And people understand pretty well how to write down the hydrodynamic equations for liquid crystals. So let me write them out. Um, and they look pretty messy if you're not used to them. But the only important thing really, unless you're an expert, is what's going on in this box at the top. So this is the Navier-Stokes level equations, the continuum equations for liquid crystals. So first of all, we need an equation for the order parameter Q. Q is advected by the flow field. And then it's also turned by the flow field because the liquid crystal molecules are long and thin. So if you have any sort of shear flow, they're going to be turned around like this. And then I want a term which says that I relax to the minimum of the free energy. And so in equilibrium, my system is described by free energy. And for liquid crystals, it's typically described by the landau degen free energy, which has a bulk term and also an elastic term, which says that if I move away from the pneumatic order, there's some extra energy associated with that. That's the equation for the order parameter. Then I need an equation for the flow. And the way I've written it here, it looks pretty much like the Navier-Stokes equation. Here's the usual inertial term for U is equal to the gradient of the stress tensor. And in Navier-Stokes, this stress tensor would be the pressure plus a viscous term, which depends on velocity gradients. The extra thing in liquid crystals is um, an elastic term, which is a sort of backflow term, which says that as the molecules turn or move, they're going to set up a flow field. So it's pretty messy, but, but this is well understood. People really understand what's going on in terms of the continuum equations of these passive liquid crystals. So then we want to ask, okay, but what we've got here is an active system. So let's take the equations and ask, how do we change these if we've got an active system? Well, for an active system, what have I got? Let's think in terms of the, of the swimmers, the bacterial swimmers. So these things are swimming around and because they're swimming, they're going to produce extra flows and extra stresses in the fluid. So the flow field around one of these swimmers, the far flow field looks like this. You can see that the swimmer pushes fluid out from its ends and pulls it in from its sides. It's a dipolar flow field. It has pneumatic symmetry. It has symmetry around this axis, but this end and this end are the same. And so uh, uh, th this thing has pneumatic symmetry. The reason that swimmer has a flow field like that is because it's self-propelled. It's self-propelled and so by Newton's second law, there can't be a net force on it. So the forces have to be equal and opposite forces. And if you do a multiple expansion, if you add up the flow fields from these forces, what you end up with is this dipolar flow field. So each of the little swimmers produces a dipolar flow field and that has pneumatic symmetry and that's really the reason that you have to start with the pneumatic equations of motion to, 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 to describe the hydrodynamics of these active systems. While I'm here, let me just introduce some words which I'll be using later on. The flow field here is an extensile one. By extensile, I mean that it's, the flow is pushed out from the ends of the swimmer and pulled in from the sides. You can also change the sign and you can have swimmers uh, which pull fluid in from the ends and push it out from the sides. Chlamydomonas is one which has a flow field approximately like this. Okay, so these flow fields are going to cause stresses and then you have to do a bit of maths, which was first done by Sri Ram Ramaswamy. And what you end up with is um, how to put the effect of these swimmers in the equations of motion. 
And it turns out to be very simple. What you need is an active term which comes in the stress tensor. The active term turns out to be proportional to the Q tensor. Sort of makes sense given the symmetry of the flow field. And there's this zeta is the strength of the activity. And this comes in the stress. It comes in that thing there under a derivative. And that's really important because it says that if there's any change in Q, any change in the Q tensor, any change in the order parameter, um, then there's going to be uh, a non-zero der derivative. And you so, so you're going to get stresses and therefore you're going to get flows. And you can explain an awful lot about these active systems just by that simple ob observation that the that, that gradients in the order parameter give you stresses and therefore give you flows. So now let's look at an active pneumatic and see what happens if we turn on the activity. So this is the passive pneumatic. Maybe you could think of it as a load of swimmers, which being like soldiers working in, in, in lines. And then let's turn on the activity and assume that there's a small fluctuation. Let's have a small bend fluctuation in the pneumatic ordering. The order parameter is changing, so that sets up flows. And it turns out, if you work it out, that the flows are in this direction. And so they're going to increase the pneumatic order, and you're going to get a system which is unstable to any fluctuations. And it turns out that the extensile systems are unstable to bend instabilities, and the contractile ones aren't but you've had it anyway because those are unstable to splay instabilities. So what we're saying here is that if you do a linear stability analysis um, on the active pneumatic equations of motion, the pneumatic state is unstable and you cross over to something else and then you have to say, well, what else? And if you're gonna find out what else, you actually have to solve the equations of motion Okay, so hopefully we're going to find something like this. So let's solve the equations of motion. And what I'm plotting here is the velocity field. And you can see you get a pretty turbulent velocity field. The yellow streaks are places where the, um, where the velocity is, is particularly um, strong. And down here I've plotted the vorticity field. The red bits are regions of high anti-clockwise vorticity. The blue regions are regions of high clockwise vorticity. And this sort of length scale is about sort of five to 10 swimmer widths. And if I play that micro swimmer picture again, the, the real thing, you can see the vorticity um, there, which we're reproducing um, in the simulations. So we're reproducing active turbulence. And if you measure things like correlation functions, they come out very similarly in all the experiments I showed you and in the, um, and in the simulations. I'm now just going to, for the next couple of slides, just sort of um, talk about something a little bit different. Um, so don't worry about it too much. We'll come back to topological defects in a minute. But, but something that puzzled me a lot for a long time is that here we're expanding, we did the linear stability analysis around a state which was um, a, a pneumatic state. But to get that pneumatic state, we have thermodynamic ordering. It's the free energy which puts us in that pneumatic state. And for a lot of these pneumatic systems, if you turn off the activity, there's no real reason why it should be a pneumatic. If you take, say, the swimmers and you turn off the activity, they're not going to nicely line up in a pneumatic. Um, and so the thermodynamic ordering is, is, is a bit strange. But it actually turns out there's a second instability, which is less well known, but which saves you in these systems. <coughs> and that is if you start off in an isotropic state, the isotropic state is unstable to pneumatic order. This is due to the flow in the isotropic state, the active flow. Works like this. 
if I have a wave vector going in this direction, so let me put on a perturbation which has a wave vector going in this direction. And so I get a small fluctuation so that I get ordering with the pneumatic director in this direction, but the wave vector of the ordering along here. This is meant to be a tiny perturbation. It's not meant to be super lined up, but let's draw it like this for now. So this is lined up pneumatically and it's an extensile system. And so it's going to create flows and I've drawn the flows in red here. And then this bit isn't ordered, but it's in a shear flow. And as long as it's flow aligning, this shear flow is going to align this bit as well. And so what's gonna happen is this is going to get aligned and the whole thing's going to bootstrap itself into a state where you have um, pneumatic ordering. And then once you've got the pneumatic order, instability one is going to kick in and it's going to destroy the pneumatic order again and give you active turbulence. But this helps to explain why even when you start with an isotropic system, as long as it's able to pneumatic order pneumatically, it doesn't have to have thermodynamic forces ordering it pneumatically. Um, the activity itself will give you enough pneumatic order um, so that you can end up getting active turbulence. Okay, so we've got active turbulence. We've got an isotropic state, which has sort of small amounts of local pneumatic order, but, but, um, but on a longer length scale, it's being mucked up by all these uh, turbulent flows. What about the topological defects? So this is a picture where the plus a half um, topological defects are red and the minus a half topological defects are blue. And what you can see is that the defects, at least to start with, do what they're meant to do and draw, destroy each other in pairs. But then if you look carefully up here, I think I'm gonna get it right there. You see that it's not just that they're destroying each other, some of them are disappearing, but new ones are popping out. You're getting plus and minus a half defects being created in pairs. And if you look at the end, I've got pretty much the same number of defects as when I started. And indeed one ends up with a steady state, a steady state, let me play it again, um, a steady state where defects are continually being created in pairs, moving around and then getting destroyed in pairs. One of the reasons this works is that the defects are self-motile. If you look at this plus a half defect, it's pretty obvious that the director field is changing. Director field is changing means that you have stresses and that means you have flows, and because this thing is a polar object, um, it, it doesn't have right-left symmetry, those flows act to push it in this direction if the thing's extensile, and to push it in that direction if it's contractile. And that helps these defects to escape from each other once they've been created. Once you get a plus and minus formed, the plus a half zooms off and then annihilates with a different minus a half. This one here creates flows as well. The picture of it on the next slide, I think. Um, this is the flows around a minus a half defect. This doesn't move, it's not self-propelled. It moves in the background flow, but it doesn't create flow itself just because of its symmetry. It creates a flow field, these six vortices around it, but it doesn't actually, it's not actually self-propelled. So let's look at the experiments again and see if we can have a look at these defects and see if we can see them. Um, this is from the Bacillodin group. And what you can see is this active turbulence and the green dots are plus a half topological defects. Uh, you can see them moving here. And if you wait till the end, there's a very nice threefold minus a half defect. The difference here is that they're more molecular motors um, over on this side. And so everything's moving faster and, and the defect, they're more topological defects. 
The way these things are formed is that the microtubules bend and then are pushed outwards by the active flows. As they bend, they create this threefold minus a half defect here and a plus a half defect there. The flows push this one out, this one self-propelled, and so it moves, and it moves away from the minus a half defect. So that's active pneumatics. Almost everything can be explained, <coughs> at least in the simulations, by saying that gradients in the order parameter give you stresses and flows, and you get these active topological defects. We do not really have a theory of this, a proper predictive theory. We understand what's going on from the simulations. Um, and I know with this sort of audience, everyone immediately says costal at Salus, but these things are out of equilibrium and it's proving difficult to write down um, a theory of that sort of, that sort of um, level. Okay, so now let's move on and let's actually use this. And um, what I'm going to talk about now is um, things that we're really trying to do and trying to understand using these sorts of ideas in biology. So, so <coughs> let, me ex let me start by giving you some, some examples. Oh, yeah, I must say this. Let me start by telling you about these wonderful people who are graduate students in my group. And certainly the work I'm going to talk about wouldn't be done. Uh, without Liam and Marana doing such a brilliant job. So what I'm going to concentrate on is shape changes in biological systems and talk about whether activity can cause changes in shape and in particular whether topological defects can have anything to do with these changes in shape. So my first example is epithelial cells and it's work from the Geneva group. Um, what they did is put epithelial cells on um, a, 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 in circular confinement, in fairly small circular confinement. And these cells um, have pneumatic symmetry, they're elongated cells. And if they're just uh, sitting on here as they become dense, they form a pneumatic phase. And because it's in circular confinement, there's a plus one topological defect at the center, uh, a defect where um, the, 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 the director goes around the center. And what you find if you um, allow these cells to get denser and denser, if you allow them to divide, is that first of all, you get flow around, the, um, around this, this region, and then the cells start forming um, a bump from the center. So the topological defects pushes somehow the cells out and you end up with a shape like this with the flow going a bit like a helter-skelter around this shape. Another active system is um, Pseudomonas. And so these are crawling um, bacteria. And this is some, some of our work. Um, if these bacteria look very obviously pneumatic just because of their shape, and you can see if you look at them that you get local regions of pneumatic order. And in here you can identify topological defects. The plus ones here are in orange, and the minus ones are in blue. What happens is that you end up getting little regions in this layer as the bacteria move around. Some of them get pushed up so that they're standing on end and you get these vertical regions forming. And then these vertical regions grow and you essentially get a biofilm in this system. It's topological defects which start off these vertical regions. Two plus a half defects move towards each other. They're allowed to do that because they're moving and so they overcome any elastic repulsion and they tend to move around each other. This creates flows which tend to push the, um, tend to push the bacteria so they're standing upwards 
and the movie actually shows that's happening. Here you can see this actually happening, those defects were moving together and they form this verticalized region in the center, which we've got in color here. And looking from the side, you can see how these things are sticking up. So it's defects which are starting this off. One more example, which is a much more general example, and this is um, embryogenesis. I mean, embryogenesis is, is basically when you start from an egg and end up with a human. And so there's an awful lot of shape change which is going on. In early embryogenesis, it's called gastrulation. And what happens in gastrulation is that you start with a ring of cells and then these differentiate and bend. So you get this invagination, you get invagination till you end up with something which is a rather different shape and which, um, and, and, and which ends up with three different sorts of cells which are going to differentiate and grow into different organs. And it's a fascinating system. I don't believe that it's really understood. And there's still many questions about whether it's biology or whether physics is important. But if we look at gastrulation in the chick embryo, you will see along here, this inwards bit forming. And what you can see is really quite large scale flow fields. So large scale flow fields are driving the shape change in this system. So somehow the system is organizing itself to have these, these, these flow fields, which, which reach over um, of, order, of order a good fraction of a millimeter. We don't really understand that yet. Um, and being theoretical physicists, we have to start simple. So I'm going to tell you about two pieces of work which are sort of aiming at this sort of problem, but you'll see that we still have a long way to go. But we found things which really quite surprised us. So we wanted to think about moving into three dimensions. So we started with a system which was a two dimensional layer of active pneumatic and the geometry can't change. The layer has to stay two dimensional. We, but we allowed the director, the pneumatic director to point out of the plane along the Z axis. So the pneumatic director could point in the third direction and we also allowed the flow field in the third direction. And so if it wanted to, it could push the director out of the plane. And then we measured the fraction of the nematogens pointing out of the plane as a function of activity. And what we found was that if the activity is negative, if I have a contractile system, nothing happened. Everything just stayed put in the plane. But if I had an extensile system, the nematogens really like to flip up into the Z direction. So extensile systems drive things along the Z axis. That comes out very nicely from a linear stability analysis. If you do the linear stability analysis, this omega tells me about the growth of the perturbation in a plane and theta is the angle between the um, between Q, the direct, the, the, the wave vector of the perturbation Q and the pneumatic director. So theta is zero is a bend perturbation. So a bend perturbation and positive um, activity gives you growth. Theta equals pi by two is a splater perturbation. So splay perturbation and negative activity, which corresponds to a contractile system, gives you positive growth. So that's what we expect for in the plane. However, going out of the plane, you have a cos squared theta here, and that's always positive. So what that says is, if I have an extensile system with positive activity, you're always going to get these things wanting to push out of the plane. And if you have a contractile system, they just stay put in the plane. So then let's look and see what happens if these move out of the plane. And we were very surprised at the patterns that you get. So this is an extensile system sitting about here. We're looking down on this flat plane. The white regions have moved, so they're pointing out of the plane. 
and they've left behind in-plane regions, which are shown in black. And you can see that you get this very, um, I mean, you get, you get, you get a pattern of, of what we call snakes because of the shape they are forming in the plane. And these snakes are dynamic, they continually grow and then they divide. And then if they're tiny, they tend to pop up again. And, and so you end up with a steady state number of snakes. And I put blue dots at the end of snakes. These are places where there are twist defects. They're twist defects which mediate the director from being in plane inside the snake to being pointing upwards out of the plane outside the snake. Let's look at the dynamics of that state. We can get this to move. Okay, so you can see that the snakes wriggle around all over the place. The reason they grow is that the flow is along the snakes, which tend to put them outwards. I'll, I'll, I'll show you some pictures showing the dynamics in a minute. And you end up with this sort of steady state where the snakes are growing and dividing. If they get too small, they pop up out of the plane uh, and that takes account of the ones that are dividing. So you end up with a steady state number of these snakes. The dynamics looks like this. The flow field tends to elongate these things, and so they grow. The directive field aligns along the snake, and so it's almost a pneumatic director. If I have a pneumatic system in an extensile, um, in, in, and if I have a, a pneumatic in an extensile flows, it's going to be unstable until you get a bend instability. Here it's starting to bend. If it bends a lot, it's the same as forming topological defects. Around the defect, it becomes easier for the flow to push the director out of the plane. And so what you get is an out of plane region forming here. And the thing breaks up into two individual snakes. And you end up with this really very complicated dynamics. Okay, so what does this tell me about three dimensions? Um, well, let, let, let's move. Now I'm going to jump now and I'm going to jump to three dimensions because it'd be nice to understand this active system in three dimensions. And in particular, and again, it's so in a Dogics group, people are now able to do experiments on active pneumatics in three dimensions. It's this microtubule motor system again, but the clever thing that von Dogic and his collaborators did was put these in a background of pneumatic colloids, which sort of helped the thing being pneumatic, and that gave it enough pneumatic order to form active turbulence. And again, you get active turbulence, but instead of topological defects that you get in two dimensions, in three dimensions, you get disclination lines. And this is um, experiments showing the dynamics of these disclination lines. And you can see they're twisting around all over the place. Uh, they're not allowed to end except on boundaries. And so they appear as loops and they can also um, decay as loops. I think what we've got here is, is, is a loop which, which forms. So just looking at a single loop now and the dynamics of, of, of a loop. And the loops can disappear and they can also appear. And so you get this really quite complicated um, story in, in, in 3D. So let's look at the cross section of one of those loops. So what I'm going to do now is a picture which looks at a loop and looks at the cross section across a loop. So the 2D cross section across a loop. Okay, so my disinclination line is going like this and the cross section should go back into the, the, the screen, but I can't do that because I can't see it then. So I've sort of tilted it a bit, but we're looking at a cross section of the loop. And 
Sometimes the cross section looks just like a, a minus a half defect, in which case it's called a wedge, or it can look just like a plus a half defect, which is also called a wedge. So the cross section looks like a plus a half or a minus a half. And, and, but the difference in, th in three dimensions is that also the, the director can move out of this plane. And so you can get in the middle a twist configuration where the director is pointing along the disclination and has moved out of the plane. So these things are not actually topological defects anymore because they can twist, they can, they can turn into each other by twisting out of the plane and then twisting back again. And the angle, the twist angle, which tells you whether I've got a minus a half or a plus a half or something in the middle is this one here. And it turns out that in extensile systems, you tend to get twist cross sections. And in contractile systems, you tend to get these wedge cross sections. And that's actually easy to explain from our 2D simulations because remember the extensile ones wanted to pop out of the plane and it's the twist ones which are popped out of the plane. So here I'm plotting um, this, 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 this twist angle, probably the cosine of the twist angle. Okay, and this one here corresponds to having lots of twist cross sections, whereas the contractile system tends to end up having, <coughs> having wedge configurations. So, um, so, so, so the 2D cross section fits with what's happening in three dimensions. But what we actually wanted to do when we were doing this, what we were after is trying to look at a droplet of this active pneumatic. So now I'm talking about um, three dimensional blobs of active pneumatic in an isotropic background. So it's a droplet. It's a droplet of active pneumatic. What I'm talking about is simulations, the experimental system, no one's done the experiments yet, but you could imagine that maybe biological tissues were like this, okay? And let's just see what they look like, these blobs. Uh, move around, they've got surface tension, so they tend to be circular, but the activity is pushing them not to be circular. What I'm drawing here is the topological, uh, the, the disclination lines inside the drop. And the picture here just shows where the disclination lines hit the surface, because how these things behave, it turns out to be pretty um, important where the disclination lines hit the surface. Um, let me remind you, these lines have to form loops, but they can stop on the surface. So what we're trying to do here is understand the, the interplay between the activity pushing the drop around and the flow fields set up by the disclination lines and the surface tension trying to get the drop back to the right shape. Now it turns out to be very important whether this is an extensile or a contractile drop. It really makes a big difference. And the reason is something called active anchoring. If I have an extensile drop with extensile flows, the flows tend to make the pneumatic anchoring on the surface of the drop an in-plane anchoring. It makes sense that you have surface flows because the order parameter, the pneumatic order parameter is changing from a finite value inside the drop to zero outside the drop. And so there's a change in the order parameter and so they're stresses and so they're flows. And so there are these surface flows, which we've, called that, we've come to call active anchoring. And if they're extensile, you get this director which wants to sit in the plane and if they're contractile, you get a director which wants to point normal to the plane. So let's look at extensile drops to start with. Oh, sorry, forgot about this one. Should be looking at that. Okay, so this is just showing you this active anchoring. 
This is a system of bacteria which are dividing and cell division acts like extensile flows. And so you expect anchoring parallel to the surface and that's exactly what you got on the outside of this drop. And there's a nice topological defect while we're at it. Sorry, so this is what I was trying to say. Okay, so this is an extensile drop. The ordering um, is in plane on the surface. We've turned down the surface tension so it can deform a bit more. And what you see is these arms sticking out from the side of the drop. These arms form where there are topological defects. Around topological defects, you get flows and this pushes um, material out until the surface tension wins, the topological defects escapes from the end of the arm and it pulls back in. And this has actually been seen and was seen in one of the very early experiments on these systems. So this is um, the microtubule motor mixture on the outside of a vesicle. And what you'll see is arms sticking out and the arms stick out at the position of the defects. And they're much thinner <coughs> and longer and generally nicer than in the simulations. But that's the problem with, 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 with the resolution of the simulations. It's a diffuse interface model. And so we really can't get our arms as thin as we like due to relative to the, to the size of the, of the drop. So that's extensile systems. What about contractile ones? In a contractile system, the order wants to be that the surface anchoring wants to be perpendicular to the surface. And so where the distillation lines hit the surface, the thing is pretty unhappy because you're always going to get some places where the director lies in the surface. The best you can do is a twist defect, because at least half of it then points out of the surface. And what happens is that the twist defects line up with each other. So they're pointing towards each other because this minimizes the amount of wrong in-plane director. And then you get lines joining the defects where you have in-plane anchoring and the flows tend to push these outwards. So what you end up with is a system which looks pretty much like a walnut. And you end up with this sort of pattern. Here are the lines joining the places where the discrimination lines join the surface. Here the anchoring is in plane and the flows tend to push these out and you tend to get a walnut shaped um, system. Just one more because you see this invagination thing. <clears throat> this is a tiny contractile drop. Tiny contractile drop, contractile. So the director wants to anchor normal to the surface. And that's really, really miserable doing that because it means that it has to have a hedgehog-like defect in the middle, which is very energetically unfavorable. So what it does is that it produces a ring around the droplet of in-plane anchoring. This ring becomes unstable. It moves upwards, it produces flows, and then you get invagination, very much like we saw in the pictures of gastrulation. So activity and topological defects can give you an amazing number of shapes. Let's just finish by looking at the biology. This is Drosophila growing. And what we're seeing here is individual cells. And what it shows is that nature is much better at it than we are, but it also shows that activity and flows may be playing a role and putting together this with the biology, we might learn more about these, um, these amazing morphogenic changes in animals. So, so that's what we're trying to explain eventually. I've talked about active pneumatics and um, topological defects. I've put a, a couple of references there in case anyone is interested.
Thank you very much for listening. I hope one day to be able to meet many of you in person again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia, for this wonderful talk. I really enjoyed the whole thing and the beautiful movies and explanations. So now it's turn for our questions. I don't know if we have any. Uh, let me see. I'm not very much expert with, with this. Hans? Hans? Yes, yes. Hi, Hello. Julia. Hello. Hello. It was a great talk. Thank you very much. I've always been very uh, puzzled about this uh, active turbulence. Uh, my question is, how far does this analogy, analogy to turbulence really go? I mean, can you check that there is a cascade or that there is a Kolmogorov scaling or that there's a Richardson law or whatever, is there, are there more evidences that this is precisely like turbulence? No, no, it's, um, I mean, it's turbulence as in a lay person would, would use it. Um, and I think the turbulence community are not very pleased with us using this word. Um, people have looked for scaling and um, there, there's, there's scaling in certain limits, but it really is not Kolmogorov scaling at all. And you wouldn't expect it to be because here you're pumping in energy at small scales and then it's coming out at the scale of these vortices. Um, so, so I don't think in fact, it's very helpful to think of it in terms of real turbulence. It's just sort of a chaotic state. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Hans. Any other question for the, from the audience? I have a, a very small question myself. I worked some years ago with my friends in, in Palma de Mallorca. Some of them are connected here, I see, uh, on a model of bacteria. It was just a mathematical model in which bacteria were competing with each other. They could reproduce or die. And owing to this reproduction, I mean, to this competition, they form patterns. So they kind of crystallized, but the crystal had defects, topological defects. The problem and the model was very much non-equilibrium one. So you have absorbing states, you have a lot of non-equilibrium components, but the still at the end of the day, the transition to ordering when you lowered very much the noise was exactly identical to the one in equilibrium melting. So the same uh, Kosterlitz, Taulas, uh, Nelson, Halper, Young theory applied very much. So all the non-equilibrium components were irrelevant from the phase transition point of view. I would say that here in your case with this active pneumatics, the thing is much farther away from equilibrium. I don't know whether you could expect that even in some low noise limit, you could recover uh, costerlitz taulas like type of transition or, or really you think this is something else is really different. I mean, there has to be a, a limit where it becomes costly at Salus because we've got 2D, 2D pneumatic here. So mm -hmm. if you turn off the activity completely, sure. mm -hmm. it's going to be costly at Salus. But um, I mean, my guess is that the minute you become non-equilibrium, mm -hmm. you, you lose most of that. But we don't know. I mean, it, it would be very nice to, to do better than, than that. Right. You know, there's big questions there. Sorry, can't help. Great, but it was just a curiosity. Okay, so uh, if there is no other question from the audience, I'm checking here not to leave anyone out. I don't think so. So I think we will, we can uh, thank again Julia for the wonderful talk. And uh, we can meet again in how long? In three, four minutes to start with Daniel Fisher and the next talk. So. Thanks again, Julia, and we wait uh, till five o'clock. Great, thanks. Thank Bye you. Everyone. You're here. Bye. Bye.